What's up, guys? We're here live with the post game show for Big League Podcast. Uh, we just wanted to do an, an after uh, podcast review on on just breaking down the podcast on the guests and talking about some different things um, around the game as well. Um, obviously, we have uh, Eddie Gonzalez and Jerry Gonzalez who are part of the team. Uh, they do phenomenal behind the scenes work, so it's nice to have them in front of the camera so you guys get to know them a little bit um, and as well as give their perspectives on the game. Uh, and so uh, I'm sure they'll have some some good insight uh, and good feedback uh, on the podcast as well as the game. So let's dive in. Where, where do you want to start, Eddie? Obviously, this was your idea to do a post-game show. So where do you want to start? Well, I don't know if um, this will offend some people, but I was going to introduce myself as Special Ed, and then I thought, you know what, that's probably not a good idea. So I'll, I'll, uh, I'm probably not going to go with Special Ed this, on this one. Uh, so we'll just call it Ed until we come up with a name for, for the show. Uh, but the whole idea, yeah, like you said, Matt, is uh, I wanted to get your perspective. I want to talk to you. Uh, this is uh, your great show, the Big League Podcast, uh, where we're getting major league stars to come in and talk about, you know, things that they went through or achievements they had, et cetera, questions that we want to share with our audience. And uh, and in this case, your very first week, your very first episode, you had Tyler Glass now, who just signed a big deal you know, with the L.A. Dodgers, he's going to be there long term. Uh, you know, I just want to get your perspective. How was that first interview with him? Yeah, with your first I, I, I think it went fine. Uh, I think for myself, I, I, I was a little bit nervous. Uh, obviously, on the intro, the, the lengthy intro of like trying to memorize that and you're in your live and you're recording. Uh, and then obviously the guest is sitting in the seat. It, it puts a little bit of pressure on you. But I think it went really well. Um, I think I talked a little bit too much, but probably because I was excited and it was my first guest. And um, I think as, an, as a player who played 14 years, I feel like I'll, I'm so excited to share my stories and my perspectives on the game. Um, and so for, for me going forward, it's probably going to be uh, ask him more questions and let, th and let them talk a little bit more. I don't think you did a bad job, Jerry. What do you think? Did, did he do well, a bad job? Other, other than you cuffing up a lung in the middle of the yep, whole sorry. thing, I think, I think it was fantastic. Eddie had to run out of this thing uh but um you know i i think this is this is a good idea for 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 after or post show uh we, you know we have different views on a lot of things and we'll, we'll go back and forth so it's good uh to have that in everything that we do because then we'll have different topics and things to talk about after the show hey for the audience at home i was actually the guy back there on the camera trying to keep everyone quiet and i'm like shit nobody make a noise here we got a tyler glass now you know don't make a sound and here comes and, Eddie and coughing I up a lot. I felt like something I ate for lunch or something got stuck in my throat and <laughs> in the middle of the interview. So I don't know if they saw that or if they, said. Did they capture that. or <laughs> Oh, it's on there. It's, it's on, on there. there. You can, look it up. You can find it. Out, it. I tried to lower that a little bit. Uh, yeah, so that was not good. But, you know, I, I overall think that Matt did a good job with Matt his first Matt did a fantastic job. Uh, I mean, he's... He does Apple TV, you do MLB Network, so... Yeah, this year is actually going to be um, interesting. Uh, um, that was part of the conversations recently of just like, hey, you know, how do we get more involved with MLB Network? Apple TV is actually contracting out uh, MLB Network to do their shows. Friday Night Baseball, they typically pick up two, uh, two games, and then you'll do a pre- and post-game for both shows. And uh, usually, you know, they'll have the host... They'll have uh, two kind of like commentators, color guys that add perspective around the game, as well as they have me do a breakdown on one of the players, which is pretty cool. Um, so last year was my first year of doing uh, broadcasting. And um, and I did some uh, work for Bally's, which covers the Rays as well. So you're going to be doing that this year as well? Yeah, I think I'll be doing it this year so as well. So you'll be doing the Rays, Apple TV for MLB, any other broadcasting type of game? Yeah, I'd like be to involved? do. I mean, MLB Network, I think, is is such a great platform. It's a national platform. I mean, I think they do an incredible job. Um, their whole studio is is amazing. It's beautiful. They have five massive studios in there. And, uh, and it's funny, when you go through the building, hockey will have like a small little closet. <laughs> and you're just like, you're like, oh, man, NHL is, is this small closet and MLB is like five massive studios uh so it's really cool to see like what they've built in there well with your career having all those interviews and and doing mlb network and apple tv you, you look like a natural doing this so I, I thought you did a tremendous job well i think it's awesome to see the progression right you're just coming off of a playing career 
MLB All-Star, nearly 15 years in the show. You're getting into broadcast, just finished a full first year. We're starting our podcast. Uh, you know, three cool friends here just kind of uh, sharing some great content with the with the fans that are following along. And now we're in a position where, you know, your name and your, and your legacy behind the microphone can expand and grow. And I think that uh, even though it doesn't seem like much right now, I think that you're going to end up here in the next two years or so, maybe sitting in one of those chairs in one of the shows with, uh, you know, a much, much bigger audience, much bigger pay, which is cha-ching. That's what, you know, that's, that's the win right there. You, do you see yourself doing that? Yeah, I, I think, um, you know, you, once you're done playing, you, you, you really just get this, this identity ripped away from you. And, and it's such a hard transition for so many players that either most of them either go into coaching or, or have a really hard time just transitioning out of the game because your, your identity is attached to the game. And not only does your identity attach to the game, but doing something at the highest level and, and significance, performing in front of so many people, and then you're, you're making really good money and that money goes to zero, right? And so a lot of guys, okay, what are, what are the options here? You can go coach and you're going to spend a ton of time on the field. Obviously, you've sacrificed so much time away from your family, away from home already that you miss so many weddings and birthdays and things that, that people don't really realize. Um, and it's, it is, it, it's part of it, right? Like, and, and you have to kind of give something up. Um, or you can, you know, kind of, for me, it was like weighing the options. Do I want to coach? I think I would love coaching. You're going to sacrifice all that time. And, and, and really, if you want to go the manager route, you would probably have to go back through the minor leagues and t- long bus rides, 12 hour bus rides. And, and you wouldn't really get paid nearly what you would at the big leagues, right? And so for me, um, I, I like the idea of having a little bit more flexibility um, and felt comfortable enough in front of a camera and speaking uh, to be able to do the broadcasting side. And obviously, just like anything, you got to get your foot in the door, you got to start somewhere, and you kind of have to build off of that. And so it's, it's kind of been a learning curve, it's been a process, uh, but I'm enjoying it so far. Well, we're excited to see what's ahead and what's in store in your broadcast career and uh, everything else we got going on for some cool uh, business ideas, helping some high schoolers with a big league accelerator program that we launched. Uh, uh, we also have, you know, the big league podcast that will continue to grow as we get the biggest stars in here talking baseball. Uh, one of the things I wanted to ask you was um, obviously your first episode with Glass Snow. Uh, did I say that right? Glass Snow or Glass, Glass Now? Glass Now. Glass Now. Uh, right you now. You know, he... he uh, Right here. Yeah, he had a question or or a concern that kind of left me with a question. And I wanted to ask you your opinion on it. You know, um, he mentioned something about not talking about the sticky stuff in his hand when asked the question if he thinks that the sticky stuff in the hand, you know, uh, and and the issues in Major League Baseball with with the questioning of the pitchers with sticky stuff in the hand. And he kind of avoided it. You know, what are your thoughts on that? Do you think it's it's something that maybe pitchers just don't like talking about? Yeah, so this was on um, the Patreon. We had this on the Patreon. This is extra content that that we dive into. Um, just a, again, more edgy questions. Um, you know, hot topics uh, for for anybody that wants to pay a little bit extra. It's five, five, ten dollars a month, and and obviously you get access to uh, additional content where we really try to touch. We go to the edge, right, and and ask these uncomfortable questions. Um, and and one of those questions was along the lines of like the sticky stuff. And and I think you got a little bit frustrated just because he's been asked that question a lot um, and as a pitcher it's got to be really uncomfortable to to talk about like the sticky stuff because it was it was prevalent and and I almost think about like the steroid era where it's like okay I remember coming up and all these guys were just massive and everybody's doing steroids and you're and for me I was a skinny guy and I'm like how am I supposed to compete with this guy and so like in my mind as a as a hitter I didn't mind pitchers having some kind of tack uh, and usually it was rosin and uh, tar Right, and so it would give them some some grip. Um, obviously, it, it got to the point where the sticky stuff got so advanced it was spider tech that the guys were using. Obviously, Bauer was the one that came out and, and spoke about it. Um, and so, like the the grip, the, their ability to spin the ball just went through the roof. It was off the charts. And I can tell you, as a hitter. Like it was insane seeing what these guys were throwing. It was like wiffle ball stuff where like these balls would would pop and and they were so sharp. The off speed was so sharp that it became so much harder to hit. That's why you see the strikeouts that were really rising. Um, The averages were dropping. Obviously, the shift was a big part of that. 
Um, but for Glass now, I think he addressed that question a lot, and I think it was just something for him that he was like, you know, a I already of, talked about it. A lot of people it. are asking in the same. I think. I think also he started talking about like every time he threw the ball regularly from the surgery that he had, that his ball cut so much that maybe people were thinking that oh, it's because you're using stuff now in the pitching mound that you're throwing pitches like that, and, and maybe he just doesn't feel comfortable because people are attacking him about it. Well, I think you know when you look at the history of the game. 100 plus years, things like sign stealing, using tar on the mound, you know, or back in the day doing whatever, lotion and or calling it the spitball. Like you're, 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 you're taking all the the game's natural thing, right? There's no more impact at it. the play. It was all part of the it's game. It's all part of the game from, from the conception of the game. And now it's gotten to the point where, you know, Major League Baseball is banning so many things and but allowing certain things. And, you know, I, I get it. Guys don't want to talk about it. But my opinion, uh, I don't care what anybody says, is I think that uh, no matter the rules that Major League Baseball is implementing in the game today, I think all those guys are still breaking them. I still think guys are using tar on the on, or, or some kind of you're still, sticky you're stuff. Still saying signals I from still, second base. I still think they're stealing signals, uh, you know, and they're still doing things that you know, like u- using substances that that probably are banned in the game. And you know, it's a touchy subject, but that's just my in- my take on it. I'm not giving anyone fact factual evidence here. I'm just saying that's my well, opinion. Well, we got a big leaguer right here. I mean, <laughs> how, what did yeah. you see? You know, with your time in the big hundred percent. Yeah, no, um, it's a it is a hot topic. It's an interesting question. Um, I can tell you, depending on the team that I played for, uh, really dictated. Um, you know what we would try and try not to do and so there were some teams where it was like hey if you're on second base right and my guy is out there and I can clearly pick up the signs and I'm like hey you know it's the first sign after you know whatever he touches his his leg or something like that um, or or first sign after two right if there's if how many outs there are is is, is pretty common um, and so there were pretty much be a sign to the hitter of just like, hey, you know, I'll rub my leg or something, take my helmet off and look out to the outfield and, and kind of say, hey, I got the, I got the sign. Um, you know, that for me, in my mind, it was a little uncomfortable, but it was also like, hey, it's kind of part of the game where it's like, hey, if a catcher is like being open and 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 my teammates out there and he's going to give me uh, the information and, and he's seeing something that he can pick up and and um, can help me be beneficial and we can help the team win, then it's kind of part of that that inside game. Now, where, where it really crosses the line is when the Astros were picking up, they were using video to film the catcher and and they were they had somebody you know basically right inside the dugout that was using I don't know if it was analytics or he was just watching the catcher and then they were banging, banging on the, on a, banging they were banging can. on the trash can <laughs> to relay well, they had to a, the hitter they had a TV in the tunnel Correct. they had a TV in the tunnel and they would and so, just sit back there and one guy would tell the other guy hey yeah. bang the drum and listen I remember you know playing for the A's and we were playing the Astros and I remember running in from the outfield and I forget who it was and they were he was like they're fucking you know give them the signs they're, they're banging on these trash cans and I'm like what I, mean, I, I can't what am I supposed to do I like I got to go hit you know I got to get ready to hit um but i can tell you from a hitter it is night and day to know what pitch is coming if i know a curveball is coming i'm going to start a tick later i'm going to look up right and i i know where this pitch has to break and my timing is going to be a lot different than it is like all right fastball all right i'm selling out for a fastball i gotta i'm going to try to catch it out front right and and it's so different like the averages are are night and day only they would know how long they've been doing this, right, before they finally were in a broadcast where the audience was very low. I don't know. I wonder if it was in Tampa Bay. I don't know where it was, but you could actually hear on TV at home the garbage can being smashed yeah, and all these I things. Mean, it was, well, they it had, was in they, Houston. They also had like a little like a little earpiece or something. I know I saw a video of of uh, Altuve hit a home run. He was rounding third. It was a walk-off home run, and he was about to go score the run. And, and they're like, don't rip my jersey off because, you know, I have something. Here. Don't rip my jersey off. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I don't know. Like I don't know. I mean, that's, now, that's does, kind of Does it really suspicious. affect the game that much? So for instance, like in the minor leagues, I used to get taught at first base as you're getting your lead, peek into the catcher because guess what? If you, if you see a curveball, you're stealing second base. So, like, you know, that part's been part of the game, which could affect the game at the end of the day, and it's never been a problem, you know. And Does it affect the game that much? 100%, yeah. without a doubt. Without a doubt. Again, you look at the averages, I can tell you hitters go from 250 to, to over 300. Again, like if I know an off-speed pitch is coming, I'm going to start a tick later. I'm, I'm just – 
I, I, those guys at that level are too good. If you know what's coming, then I know what I have to look for, right? And and I know what timing is 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 I'm going to time it up for. So like it, it completely changes the game. A good example is when when Chapman was pitching to Altuve, and I think it was like the NLCS or something, or to advance to the World Series, and he swung at the very first pitch, but it was a curveball. Like, how did you know a curveball was coming and how were you able to be perfectly on time when a guy that throws 101 miles an hour, which is so difficult yep. to do? Yeah. You know, so that there, definitely there are the some game. guys that are little freaks in that sense of just like, you know, picking up and swinging and, and yeah. doing it. And, and now to be, I feel like is one of those guys. I, I think there's an execution factor to this whole thing. Um, you know, yes, there's an advantage and a disadvantage to give the signal or what, whatever, but. I don't care if I tell you a fastball's coming, you still have to hit it. Right? Sure, 100%, There's an execution yeah. factor. Oh, 100%. Uh, it's and, still and hard that, to And do. that's where the challenge lies. Yeah. Like, it doesn't matter. At the end of the day, yes, all that is banned or illegal or, you know, or shady, even if it's not illegal, and you shouldn't do it. And, and I agree, you probably shouldn't do it, but it's been happening for 100 years, right? But in this case, there's a major execution factor, and that is that it doesn't matter if the world knows the curveball's coming, you are a batter. That's a pitcher. Which one is going to win? Is the curveball going to win or is your contact and your swing to it? Like, what are the odds that you're going to get a nice, clean hit, and, not a rollover? Or, and, you to know? That, and to that point, Glass now was talking about, hey, when you get into a 3-2 count, what are you going to throw? And he's like, I'm, the, the Rays tell them, just throw it in there. They'll get themselves out. Like, just literally throw it right in there. Throw your best pitch. Throw your best pitch, but throw it for a strike. Like it doesn't matter what it is, just throw it for a strike, let themselves let them get themselves out. You know, for for me, along those same lines, Eddie, um, I was always told the the game will police itself. Mm. You know, and, and so like, hey, if you're caught stealing signs, yeah. pitchers are gonna let you know. They're gonna they're gonna throw up and in, they're gonna freaking hit a batter, whatever. But they're gonna the game is gonna police itself. And uh, and that's I where that's where most of the fights throughout time have come from. Right. All these fights that you see and people throwing at each other comes from stealing signs and all that. That's just, and that's just the way it was handled back in the day. Versus now, you know, people are just kind of getting offended. Yeah. Or or they hit you know they're uh, a team star and you know maybe it was like uh, they thought it was intentional and they're like hey I got to retaliate and protect our guys. Exactly because of what you just said is why I believe they sh they don't need to be changing the rules of the game. Yeah. You know, you just let them police it. You want to steal signs? Steal signs. Be ready to take a fastball at 100 miles per hour up in the rib cage, or you know, whatever. But that's just what comes with the game. But you putting too many sign or too many rules in place, it's it's kind of like not letting them go out and play the game, right? And that's why I think it's it's causing an effect worldwide within the game of baseball, where people are saying, "Oh, it's boring. It's this, is that," you know. I personally feel like you let the game kind of go back and, and have a little bit of both, a little bit of the old school and have some decent rules, but don't completely take away what makes it fun, right? In hockey, they haven't canceled the rules. These dudes take off the gloves and they fight until somebody gets knocked down, right? Like, I, I'm excited to see some, for the first time ever, I like to see a, a baseball fight where they let them fight. Yeah, I mean, the problem is, is you can't fight because then you get suspended and you get fined. Yeah. And so, so guys, obviously, they deter that, right? And so, again, the game polices itself. It's almost like you're, you're kind of handcuffed from, from fighting for, for yourself and your team, you know, because you're going to get fined. You're going to get suspended. If, if you hit this guy, if you retaliate, you're going to get kicked out of the game. And so, like, pitchers are like, well, great. Now I'm going to get fined and suspended, and now I, you know what I mean? I, well, there was a there was a really cool story about uh, Sabathia. Sabathia was like one inning. Did you, did, did you hear about this one? I don't know if I'm going to get this right. It was like he was like one inning away from getting like a five hundred thousand dollar bonus, and he he was like, "F it, I'm gonna I'm gonna drill this guy. I'm gonna protect my team." He drilled the guy, got kicked out of the game. <laughs> the <didn't> finish <laughs> and, and, I remember that. Yeah, I did, remember and did that. not yes. get, not his, get his, his, his like bonus. half a million dollar bonus. But I mean, it's cool. It's one of the coolest Stupid stories because you're like. Yeah. I'm going to I'm going to protect my my team. Uh I, I that's that story was awesome. Glass now signed a long-term deal. Um he's pretty much set for life. He's making a lot of money, 137 plus millions of dollars. Um with is, a 10 with a 10 bonus. Ooh, with a 10 bonus. Just is, a sign. Is there a difference uh for someone like you, Matt? You know, you spent so much time in the big leagues, but your career was mostly, you know, Two-year deals, one-year deal, five-year, you know, you got, I think one time you got a longer than that, or was it mostly two years 
They were mostly one year deals for me. I mean, I had, I had even with the race when you were here for like what six years. Yeah, I mean, so when you come up, you the 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 team has control over you for for six years, for six years, and then you hit free agency, and so like you'll go through the first three years, and then you hit arbitration, unless you're a super two. Um, so and, you were just trying to get so, a contract mm -hmm. when you, when, with your time. Yeah. Here. So when you go through arbitration, obviously they're they're going to kind of like argue your value. Your agent argue, argues value. If you can't agree, you have to go to a legal uh, arbitration. And um, and so I didn't. I never went through the legal process. Um, we we always agreed. Uh, but I ended up going to. I got traded before my free agent year and I went to the angels um, and then had my worst year ever. Cause I was like trying to do more. I was trying to hit more home runs. Yeah, I went trying to, a to bigger, do too much, yeah. bigger, bad, high, bigger leg kick, you know, all that crap that, and I, my swing got really long and I just sucked. That's, that's what my next question was. You know, when you have that, you know, long-term deal, you're comfortable, you know, you're secured, you have a job for a long period of time, you know, and you know, when you're playing on a one-year deal, trying to earn your next contract, you know what kind of like uh, what kind of pressure is that? Uh, because you're just dealing with expectation every single day. You're showing up to work every day. You're expected to perform, and you're expecting yourself to perform. Uh, in comparison to somebody that's like, all right, I'm all set for 10 years. I mean, I can go and relax. Yeah, there's a fine line because um, it it definitely the the expectation, the pressure can drive and motivate you to to really work hard, work hard, and and um, you know push you. Um, but at the same time, it can it can create too much pressure where you tense up. And if you're tensing up and you're trying too hard, and especially with baseball, um, you can fly off the ball, pull off the ball, um, you know, whatever. Uh, your mechanics can break down just because you're there's too much pressure. You're trying too hard. You're putting too but much pressure. There's definitely guys that once they get that big contract, right. they just kind of are comfortable. All right, I'm chilling. I'm good. I'm 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 getting paid no matter what. And you see a lot of guys fall off. They fall off. A, a lot of guys that get their big contracts their numbers for some reason drop dramatically. So it could be either a guy's trying too hard or a guy just doesn't give a damn. Yeah. That's exactly why I don't see the LA Dodgers winning a World Series. All right. That's <laughs> yeah. that's that's yeah, that's yeah. my thought. You got you know well, you got, you got Yankees, AI robots uh, signing deals the, with the, the LA the Dodgers Yankees, right now. The Yankees have all these guys and they what they were last place this year and they played what over a billion dollars? <laughs> I mean, that's, that's a, another one. The Dodgers are stacked, but I just don't see how you can, you know, I, I think the uh, the bread's in the pudding kind of thing. You, you've seen it over the years that you can't buy a championship, right? Well, you played with uh, Oakland. You played for uh, Mr. Uh, Moneyball, uh, Billy Bean, right? Uh, does that really work? The Moneyball, I mean, there's some aspect of that that works, but it's not, it's not, that's not everything. You know what I mean? Clearly, um, they didn't have the payroll and budget to be able to go out and spend. And so like they, he had, you know, to kind of figure out how do we go compete with, you know, the, uh, not even a fourth a quarter to of, figure, to of, magic happen. of, of the budget of, of some of these major market teams. Um, and so that was kind of his, his way of, of figuring it out. Uh, of, hey, you know, how do we look at the numbers and how do we leverage these guys that aren't superstars um, and still compete? And obviously, I would fit really well into Oakland's model of, hey, you walk a lot and, and you're on base a lot. And so, therefore, more people are on base, the more chances of, of scoring runs. You spoke with Glass now about, you know, uh, which was one of my favorite questions. He talks about how throughout his career he had ups, he had downs, right? What was his big up? What was his big down that made him be as good as he is today? I'm sure you had something similar to that. What was your big down that maybe influenced you into surviving for 15 years with one-year deals or two-year deals? You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah, I like that question. I, I think you really learn a lot about a player and, and what they had to go through because everybody sees the the highlights, the MLB. You know, you see the five year deal that he signs for 137 million. Uh, for me, it was in Double A. Uh, I remember hitting 190 after two months in Double A, playing for the Erie Sea Wolves. Uh, I think it was 2007. And um, dude, I was so stressed. I was so frustrated. I, um, you know, I was trying really hard and and. Um, I just remember going back uh, to the to the, the we we rented a house we split a house a couple guys to share the house and and um, and I was just miserable I was I was laying in bed like tears in my eyes just like feeling like I'm not gonna make it and um, I remember getting called in the office talking to our manager Matt Wallbeck 
I say, Matt, what's going on? You know, like you're, you're struggling. You're, you know, eventually said, if you can't figure it out, we're going to have to send you down. And that didn't help, right? Like, <laughs> you know, that's not what you need to hear as, as a player, because that's going to put more pressure. And so for me, um, I started looking for answers, man. I started reading everything I could. Uh, I picked up um, probably God, three different mindset books, um, law of attraction. I got really into law of attraction and just the way I was thinking. And, and I was very negative and self-defeating of just like, I remember walking into the box, just like, man, I don't, I don't, I just don't feel like I have a chance at any point when you were going through that. Did, did your dad ever come to mind? Cause I know back in the days he'd be like, Oh, you're striking out. You stink. Blah, blah, oh, blah. My dad was... and, and then you'd be like, you know what? Screw that. Screw you dad. And bam, home yeah. run the next that bad. Did that ever? Yeah, he was tough. Um, no, nah, he, he was, he got more supportive as I got older. Um, and, and that's, I think and that's he, where the downfall happened. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, no, it's just like the grind happens. It becomes a job. You're going day after day after day. And so like, if you're struggling, it's, it's really hard to kind of dig out of that rut. You know, uh, maybe you create some bad muscle memory and you're pulling off the ball. Uh, maybe, maybe that just like the, the, even just the negative being negative and, and not being confident and positive, uh, was huge. So I remember, you know, obviously that law of attraction, I remember forcing just a lot of positive thoughts of just like, man, I'm a great hitter. I'm a great hitter. And I, and until the point where like, I really started to believe it, you built a routine and you were trying to just stick to it and be disciplined through that routine of your mental game and then going out there and just preparing for the games. Yeah. There's a lot, there's so much that goes you into had it. A, you had a conversation with glass now there, uh, before we wrap things up, uh, where he talked about overthinking and like, sometimes you get in the cage and you'll hit 500 times and you feel ready. And then you go into the game and suck. And then there's times where there's guys where they don't even do anything and they get in there and hit three home runs in a game. Yeah. yeah. I liked his, I liked his answer. I was like, you got to know yourself. You got to know yourself and know what works for you. For me, like I liked to be, to feel like I was prepared. Um, but at the same time, I didn't want to kill myself and be so sore that, that I, I didn't feel like I could perform it at a high level. Um, but there, there's definitely that sense of, of knowing yourself and knowing what works for you. Um, there's nothing like the game. And so you're trying to figure out how do I get as prepared for the game as possible without, over preparing without being too tense without trying too hard um and and so again it, it's it's easy it, it, or it's not easy man it's it's a very hard game hey it, it, this that's what it's all about it's uh you know you experience it and now you have this knowledge and wisdom and i love what we're doing here which we're getting to share it with people uh fans up and comers in the game and uh not bad for the first post game uh, pod whatever we're gonna call this hey, thing you that know what come. i'm excited and looking forward to pete alonzo <laughs> that's gonna be fun yeah and, and all the extra content that we're gonna be posting uh, that people don't know about, yeah, that's going to be a tremendous amount of fun. With the Big League Accelerator, we're trying to uh, help a lot of high school kids, right? We're trying to come up with uh, not just Matt Joyce's secrets, but Major League Baseball secrets that are going to help these guys succeed and, and excel in the game, uh, whether it's a college scholarship or maybe even making it to the pros. Uh, we're going to have a special guest coming up shortly, 15-year uh, high school coach, uh, I won't tell you his name, but when he comes in, he's going to talk about, you know, what he saw as a big problem that will help us uh, helping these players out. He what he sees in high school baseball and in high school players that we're going to be able to 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 show players across the country what they need to be doing. So stand, stay tuned for that. And we'll see you guys very soon. Yeah, great. Looking forward to it. A lot of a lot of great content coming up. So stay tuned.